So let's talk about Homegrown National Park or networking naturally. But before we do that, let's look at this. You might think that's a, a fecal sac that a mother bird has taken from the nest and just dropped on a leaf. And that, of course, is what she wants you to think it is, but it's actually a spider. It's a bola spider sitting on top of the leaf during the day. But it, at night, it hangs off the leaf and suspends a single strand of silk with one sticky glob of glue at the end. Uh, and it hopes to catch them off. And it does catch them off. And it does that by releasing a sex pheromone for a particular species of moss, and it calls in the males of that species. They get stuck to her, her little target there, and she wraps them up quickly. Uh, and once they're all wrapped up, she can have a nice, nice meal. And after she feeds on the moss, she cuts it loose and it falls to the ground. She'll do that over and over again until she gets enough energy to create a, an egg mass. This is filled with eggs. It's an ornamental little, little thing. And then she keeps hunting. Uh, well, I've been curious for several years. We always have these, these guys at our house, mostly hanging from our oak trees. What moth is she trying to, to collect? So I actually got the bodies after she cut them loose and I unwrapped them to see what she was catching. And it turns out it's bronze cutworm. And I'm glad I have bronze cutworms and I'm glad I have a lot of bronze cutworms because she had enough bronze cutworms that she was able to lay three egg masses, which to this minute are hanging from uh, the white oak in my front yard, they'll hatch this spring. And I have bronze cutworm, that's what the larva looks like because I've got goldenrods, one of their primary host plants. And I've got the white oak tree because I love oak trees, but because I have the oak tree, the, the uh, spider can hang from that. And it also gives me the dot lined white. The caterpillar eats oak leaves and then it spins a cocoon in those leaves. When the leaves fall to the ground, it's down there on the ground. There is a cocoon down there. I don't know if you can see it. It's right there. There it is up a little closer, easy to miss. And this is why raking the leaves away from the tree, you're actually throwing out a, a number of, of valuable creatures. I have uh, Megariza atreida. It's the largest ichneumonid wasp in the country. This uh, ovipositor right here is five, six inches long. It's an enormous, beautiful creature. And I have that because I've got sericid horntails. That is the, uh, that's the target of that ovipositor. They, they stick it right through white pine bark and lay an egg on the larva of that sericid. So I've got all these things because I have white pines. I've got buckeyes and they're not so beautiful larvae because I've got plantain. People say plantain, it's non-native. There's actually 30 or 40 species of native plantain as well. Now it wouldn't take me long to describe uh, all the species that live in a landscape like this, where if I tried to do that for my house, we'd be there a long time. Uh, and that's because landscapes like that don't have the golden rods, so they don't have the bronze cutworm, so they don't have the bola spider. They don't have plantain, so they don't have the buckeye. They don't have white pine, so they don't have the megarissa, and on and on and on. The point is, of course, that there's very little that can live in typical landscapes like this. And that's why we're seeing pretty nasty headlines. It's why we're experiencing biodiversity loss, not just here, but all over the planet. We hear about the insect apocalypse, the, the uh, global decline in insects. North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. Two thirds of Earth's wildlife are already gone. UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. All pretty terrible things. And that's why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write a book about the sixth great extinction that the planet has ever experienced. Uh, and we are in the middle of it. It's not something that's predicted, it's already happening. Why is it happening? Because we have not shared the planet with the natural world. We've taken everything for ourselves as if we don't need the natural world. And of course, that's not working. Jason Hickel says the biodiversity loss is such a strange euphemism for the mass destruction of non-human beings. That's what we're doing now. That's what we've been doing through most of our history. Just saw this, this map this morning in the New York, New York Times. These are the areas of the country with the greatest number of threatened species. Uh, so California is leading the way with the number of species that are, are at risk, but Florida is right, right there. Look at the panhandle. Um, and of course, the, the Appalachian Mountains. Um, so this is where, the, where the, the species are most endangered, in case you are interested. What's our reaction to these sobering statistics? People are actually studying that. Uh, Richard Hobbs wrote a paper way back in 2013, considering uh, mostly scientists' reaction to the loss of, of nature. And he says it's very similar to the five stages of grief. First, there's, there's typically denial. 
And we still see a lot of that. There are a lot of people say, well, this, this isn't happening. There's no problem. Then there's anger. I seem to get stuck in that, that phase quite a bit. The bargaining phase, then depression gets stuck in there too. Uh, and the final stage of grief is acceptance. Well, there's nothing we can do about it. So we just have to learn to live with it. And that's how Richard concluded his, his paper. This is where I take issue though. Acceptance is too easily equated with giving up and giving up's not an option, folks, we, because living with nature is not an option. Nature is not optional. So I'm gonna add a sixth stage and that is action. We have to take action uh, if we wanna remain in this planet ourselves. Now you could argue, well, we do have national parks, but if you look at the history of the national parks about why they were actually preserved, it was primarily because they had exquisite scenery. They were, they're still exquisite. And, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt recognized this and said, well, you know, these are beautiful places. Uh, they're wonderful places for recreation. It's good administration to save these, these places and we want future generations to be able to visit them. In other words, our parks were created because they were pretty places for us to play. Now, I'm not faulting Teddy because he wasn't thinking about uh, ecosystem function. Uh, the word ecosystem wasn't even uh, around yet. Ecology wasn't, wasn't discovered yet. So it really was about what nature can, can do for us. And because we've only preserved the most beautiful, exquisite places on uh, in the lower 48 states, or all the states, I guess, we've only protected 12% of the US. So what is that? 88% remains unprotected. And what has happened in that 88% is, is appalling. Every 30 seconds, a football field worth of America's natural areas is disappearing to development. And I think development is one of the most oxymoronic words in, in the English language. We've already got, we got more than 40 million acres of lawn. That's an area the size of New England. Uh, we've paved over an area larger than Ohio. We have 2 million acres of golf courses. That's an area larger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined, dedicated to golf. 484 million acres of residential property. And that's not including urban centers, which is 220 times larger than Yellowstone National Park. Now, when you develop each one of these one at a time in one place, uh, it, it's we get it that this is disturbing, but it doesn't seem like a disaster. And I ran into this, this uh, quote by Matt Lee Ashley, uh, and he said, the problem is that when you evaluate the condition of nature, it's, it's a bit like watching a leaking pipe. If a person focuses on each drop as it falls to the floor, it doesn't seem so bad. The leak hardly seems damaging. Uh, but if you leave for a day, then you come back and the entire room is full of water. And that's what we've done. We have turned our backs on this development and now the entire country is developed pretty much, pretty much. Now, before we go on, I'm going to give you a brief, brief uh, primer on ecological terms because I keep hearing that people don't understand what these things are. Um, so let's make sure we're all on the same page. We throw around the term biodiversity all the time. What does it mean? It's simply all the forms of life on Earth. We, just, we usually refer to them at the species level, but you can talk about genetic diversity. You can talk about ecosystem diversity as long as you define it. Let's just tonight we're going to talk about number of species. Biodiversity is the species that is out there. Habitat. Habitat is a, it's not just a place to live. It's a place that provides everything you need. So shelter, yes, but also food. Water is pretty easy to get in most circumstances. So that's the part that a lot of people uh, miss. Uh, they'll look at, a, at a, an invaded uh, woodlot that's covered with invasive plants and say, that's good habitat. Well, it's good shelter, but there's very little food there and that makes it bad habitat. An ecosystem is a community of, of interacting organisms and their physical environment. And ecosystem services, they're the life support that are provided by ecosystems. So everything to keep us alive on planet, we can call an ecosystem service. Uh, well, we do have these parks and preserves. We've got other areas that even if they're not permanently prote protected, they are out there. Why aren't they good enough, big enough to sustain the natural areas that, that uh, do remain? And the reason is that they're not big enough. They are too small. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little habitat patch, you say, well, that's an exaggeration. But you know, you get up in a plane, you look down, it's not a big exaggeration. The average woodlot size in the state of Delaware is 10 acres, so not very big. When you take a large area, you shrink it down to a small area, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that's the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. In bad times, they go down. 
the top line here is a large population. So even in its down cycle, there's enough individuals so it can increase quickly when times get better. But when you're a tiny population, often you fluctuate and you hit zero, you blink out of your little habitat patch. And unless you can recolonize it, you're permanently gone. And think of all the creatures that will not make it across uh, any major highway to recolonize an area if they're, if they're uh, eliminated from it. So the bottom line is that our natural areas are not large enough to sustain the amount of nature that we need to produce the amount of life support that we need, which is more every day, by the way. Uh, now we talk about extinction as if that is the, the problem. It certainly is a problem. Um, we miss the, the dodo, uh, but that I think that's missing the mark. We do have an extinction crisis, but the real crisis we have is defaunation. It's the reduction of what was once common species and make them uncommon species. It's the big, large populations of common species that are running our ecosystems. The rare species that you hardly have at all uh, are not running our ecosystems now and probably never were. They were there as part of it, but it's the big players that we miss the most. This is the American chestnut, of course. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee, you know, we talk about, well, losing it. There's only a few tiny populations left. It used to be one of the most common bumblebees in the country doing an awful lot of pollination. Now it's, a, it's, it's functionally gone. Beavers, you know, they're making a comeback, but the loss of the beaver totally changed hydrology over the entire continent uh, in, in uh, really remarkable ways. So having it come back would be a great thing, but they were common and then we changed everything. So defaunation is the real problem. Uh, it's very local. You can think about the number of species that are in your yard today. If it's not the same number that was there before it was your yard, you have removed abundance. You've removed species. Uh, it's everywhere and we don't notice it. Why don't we notice it? We don't notice it because of shifting baseline. Uh, this is a phenomenon where, where people tend to think that the way things were when you were young is the way they've always been because it's all you've ever known. So none of us, for example, miss the passenger pigeon. It was the most common bird on the planet, but it was gone before any of us were born. So we don't miss it. Um, a huge uh, ecological loss. Uh, and we can say this over and over again, uh, Carolina parakeet, the Alaskan curlew, lots and lots of very, very common species are now gone or reduced in numbers to the point where they're no longer performing the roles that they should in their ecosystem. So shifting baseline means that we're losing biodiversity. The planet is going down the tubes and we don't even notice it. Enter E.O. Wilson, uh, who spent his, his most of his career uh, trying to save biodiversity on planet Earth. He loved it, uh, and it was a constant theme throughout his very long career. I'm sure you know that he died the day after Christmas, a huge loss to, to cons the world of conservation, several other worlds as well. But in 2016, uh, that, that culminated with, with this book he called Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life, where he made the argument that in order to save life anywhere on earth, life, including us, anywhere on earth, we're gonna have to have functioning ecosystems. We're gonna have to save nature on half of the earth. And then he spent uh, the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time talking about how we're gonna do that. Uh, so we need to consider that. Um, from Wilson's Half Earth book, we uh, we actually have governments listening. We have the uh, UN listening. You've heard of the 3030 Global Initiative. People are saying it's Biden's initiative. It's not Biden's initiative. He's he's signed on to it, but so have many other countries. And the, the object is to save 30% of planet Earth by 2030. And that's step one towards saving 50% of planet Earth times by 2050. Uh, and of course, we have this idea that we're going to protect pristine habitat on 50% of planet Earth. Um, that will be a challenge. Since half of planet Earth is already in some form of agriculture, we have almost 8 billion people and all of our roads and detritus and everything else in the other half. And we don't have a third half to put aside for uh, nature. There you go, half of the planet in agriculture. <laughs> that 7.8 billion people. We've got a lot of people on the planet, folks, and they're all demanding a lot of ecosystem services. And of course, you know, this is what we've done to an awful lot of the planet. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to, to conserve nature on half of planet Earth? Well, to me, the answer actually is, is obvious. We really only have one choice. Uh, we need to give up the notion that humans and nature can't coexist. 
it's a challenge to save nature and half of the planet if we think that it's got to be someplace separate from where humans are. That's not possible anymore. Uh, so, so the notion that we can't coexist is, is not true. We, of course, can coexist. Not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that is left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature where there are a lot of people. Actually rebuild it now because we've torn it asunder in an awful lot of, of places. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Well, if our protected areas are not large enough to do that, 12% is not 30%, is not it's certainly not 50%, then again, the answer is obvious. We're going to have to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves. We're going to not only have to conserve areas like this. Where's my pointer? There it is. We're going to have to do conservation over here as well. We're talking about private property. 78% of the U.S. is privately owned. So we're going to have to practice conservation on private property. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 98% of Texas is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail. We certainly will never realize EO's dream. Okay, let's do a, a reenactment. Back in, in 2008, I was sitting at this very table, looking a little bit younger than I do now. Uh, but I had just learned that uh, 40 million acres of, of uh, the U.S. was in lawn was in turf grass. That was a brand new statistic uh, in 2005. So I was sitting there one Sunday morning and I said, well, gee, what would happen if we, we uh, cut that area in half? What would happen if we replanted half the area that's in lawn? Well, that would give us 20 million acres to work with. Uh, and um, so we're talking about taking areas like this. Of course, lawn is, is a, you know, it's a status symbol. And we need lawn to advertise our high status. We also need lawn to advertise our or, or display our Halloween costumes. But what if we cut the area in half? We could create that new national park that we're calling Homegrown National Park if we do this at home, and we could do it with 20 million acres, and it will be huge. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, plus Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. They had Ebola Sparks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park would be the biggest park in the country. Well, I had that idea back in 2008 and I started putting it in my talks and talking about it, but it wasn't until I, I wrote Nature's Best Hope, which came out in 2020, that I actually wrote a chapter about it um, and described you know, why we ought to be doing this and, and all the good things that will happen. But, um, that's all I did, you know, I, I write and talk about it, but not actually do anything. Uh, well, I gave a talk before the pandemic. I gave a talk in Connecticut. Michelle Alfandari had just retired uh, from a business career in Manhattan. She had moved up to Connecticut. Her neighbor dragged her to my talk. I don't know why, but, but she did. And Michelle sat there politely. Uh, you know, she was a businesswoman who spent 40 years in Manhattan, knew very little to nothing about nature. They didn't know we have a biodiversity crisis. So really, she's the, she's the quintessential non-choir, the person that I'm trying to reach. And she came up to me after the talk, and she said, um, she said, you know, you're, you're only talking to the choir. I said, I know. It's only the choir that invites me. She said, well, you've got to get your message to the non-choir. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that involves marketing. That involves social media. It involves all the things that I don't do. And she said, well, I do do those things and I wanna help you uh, actually build homegrown national parks. So she has created the website, homegrownnationalpark.org. She says, co-founder, um, the co part is it was my idea, but the rest of it is, is her taking, taking action. Uh, and the object is that, that uh, we want the message that everybody is an important component of the future of conservation. Everybody has a responsibility towards conservation. We want that message to go viral and to reach all the people who don't have a clue about that. Uh, you join Homegrown National Park by simply going to the website, doesn't cost anything, putting your location in, and the amount of area that you have converted to native plantings, or you're going to, you pledge to, or maybe you have a protected woodlot on your property, anything like that goes on the website and your little area of your county is going to light up with a firefly. 
And the object, of course, is to get the entire country to, to light up as, as a firefly. So this is, uh, you know, this is uh, our attempt at, at social media. We've got about 14,000 members so far. Um, so we're up to good, it's been up for, for about a year. Uh, and some people say, are you using our data? No, I don't even know what that means. Um, I can't even figure out what my, my password is, but no, we're not using your data and it's free. So there's really no real reason to do it. What is our product here? What is Homegrown National Park, Parks product? National awareness. We, we want uh, people to understand not just that there are problems. We hear that all the time. We want them to understand what the solutions are. We want them to understand that they are part of the solution. We're trying to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature is not optional. It's absolutely necessary. It's everybody's responsibility to sustain it. And by making it uh, measurable on the map, it creates uh, actually a research tool. We can measure conservation progress. Uh, by looking at those, those lit up areas. The benefits of this approach is that it converts hope to action. We can all be hopeful, hope things change, but they're not gonna change unless we have action. And this gives people, uh, it's, it's a grassroots approach to, to um, solving this, this global biodiversity cri crisis. It's aspirational, meaning um, a lot of people say, gee, I wanna be part of this. I want to be part of Homegrown National Park, and now you can actually do it. It doesn't rely on any governmental support, so we don't have to pass any laws. We don't have to, to you know, make it political and fight about it. We can all just do it ourselves. Uh, it also merges national conservation efforts that already exist. The Sierra Club, National Wildlife Federation, Audubon, Wild Ones, all of these guys are already out there talking about the same type of thing. We, all, we want to get all of these conservation efforts on the map so we can see how conservation is doing across the country. Uh, and when it's all visual, visualized, we'll get to see where the holes are. We'll get to see where we need to focus and fill in so that we make effective conservation or biological carters that connect the wild places that still exist. So eventually, uh, we're getting pretty close to this at this point. Um, every, we're going to make a, it'll look like the COVID maps you see on, on New York Times. Every county will have, be a shade of green depending on the participation in that county. So we'll get to see, uh, you know, areas, this is, this is all phony data right here, but these would be really, really uh, active counties here and light counties wouldn't be so active. And, and this will be the visualization that we're going to see. It is a grassroots call to action. Uh, it's it's science-based uh, and it's very simple. We're going to plant natives and we're going to remove invasives. So in other words, we're going to recognize that plants are more than just decorations. In the past, we viewed them as decorations and we're going to use them to, to decorate our landscapes without thinking about the ecological roles that plants must be playing around uh, everywhere. And of course, when we, when we chose plants that way, we created beautiful landscapes that were ecologically dead. This is ecological destruction, even though it's, a, it's an art form. Well, the entire planet is not a canvas for us to play with. So we need to make pretty landscapes, but also choose our plants based on ecological function. We can have beautiful landscapes that support food webs, that protect watersheds, that store carbon, that support natural enemy populations, that do all the things we need them to do uh, to not just keep us alive, but keep all the things that keep us alive, alive. Uh, and when we include ecological function as a criterion in our plant selection, then landscaping equals ecological or ecosystem restoration. Uh, so, you know, this I'm, I'm calling 21st century landscaping. We've tried 20th century landscaping and we're in the sixth great extinction. So I think it's, it's time to try something else. Who's going to help us make this transition? The fact of the matter is it's not going to be gardeners because there's not enough of them. Most people don't garden. They don't like gardening or they don't have time to garden. They simply hire somebody to maintain their landscape. It's, it's usually a, a, a lawn crew, a mow, blow and, and go crew. They come in, they do it quickly and they leave. Again, no thought to, to ecosystem function. So who are we going to hire? We need a, a brand new um, we need to fill a niche that I'm calling ecological landscapers or ecological gardeners. So instead of having to, to hire the lawn crew, you hire an ecological landscaper who will know what plants to put in your yard, will know how to design it, will know how to maintain them, uh, and you don't have to think a thing about it. That's going to hit the non-choir that is not concerned about biodiversity loss. 
Now, if you're if you're a gardener, great, you get to do it yourself. But trying to address all those people that are not gardeners, there are a number of of uh, groups that are training ecological landscapers right now. Um, I just put a few of them up here, but there's many. But we need many more. Uh, I don't know. Well, we have maybe 2,000 ecological landscapers in the country. We need 2 million or more. So it's an open niche. If you're looking for a, a career, I strongly suggest it. And ecological landscapers are going to know everything we need to know. They're going to know that every landscape has four primary ecological responsibilities. It has to support food webs. It has to sequester carbon has to clean and manage our water. It's got to protect the watershed, in other words, and it's got to support pollinators. They're going to know that the, that's what those goals are, and they're going to know that lawn accomplishes none of those goals. So they'll know them automatically. We've got to reduce the area that we have in lawn. They're going to know that some of the plants we put in our yards have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is? <clears throat> There's the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch, and if you take that stone, the arch falls apart. Well, if you take keystone plants out of, of your local food web, the food web collapses because keystone plants are making most of the food that supports the food web. What is that food? It's typically caterpillars. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other organisms than any other type of plant eater. So a landscape without caterpillars is essentially a dead landscape. They're going to know that keystone plants are the two by fours in the ecological house that you're building that are going to hold up your, your local ecosystem. Um, they're essential, they're support. We cannot build an ecosystem or an ecological house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last hundred years. You're not through building your house once you've got your, your keystone plants in place, but they're an essential component to it. Ecological landscapers are gonna know which ornamentals are invasive and which ones are okay. This is calorie pear, Bradford pear. I'm not sure how invasive it is in, in Florida, but it sure is a bad, it sure is bad news every place else. Um, so this is what it does. This is a, a land conservancy, actually, and it's thoroughly invaded with Bradford pear, calorie pear. None of those were planted. Uh, and this is a plant that supports almost no biodiversity. They're going to know that insects are the little things that run the world. That, of course, is a quote from E.O. Wilson. Um, they're going to know that they're responsible for our pollination. They're responsible for decomposition. They're the primary component of our food webs. And you lose all the animals, including us, if we lose our, our insects. So they're going to know that we're going to have to develop lands, plant, uh, landscapes with plants that support insect-based food webs. They're also going to know that 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat the plants with which they have an evolutionary history like the monarch butterfly and milkweeds. You take out the, the local milkweeds and put in hostas, the monarch's not going to start to eat hostas. So they're going to understand that, and they're going to understand that it's only native plants that are going to support those food webs. Again, we need to generate caterpillars because they're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other plant eater. If we develop landscapes without enough caterpillars, we have failed food webs. They're also going to know that we need pollinators and they're going to know why we need pollinators. Right now you hear that we need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. But you know what I'm hearing more and more? Oh, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. The actual figure is about a twelfth of our crops supported by, by pollinators. As if our crops are the only important plants on the planet. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, including our, our crops. But we need those plants to produce all those ecosystem services we already talked about. They're also going to know that light pollution and mosquito fogging uh, is, are two of the major causes of insect decline that are so easily controlled. We, you, know, you do not have to hire mosquito joe. Uh, and uh, you can turn out your light at night, or you can put in a yellow bulb, which is far less attractive to nocturnal insects than is uh, a white bulb. These are very easy things that we can change overnight to really boost insect populations. And they're going to know that conservation works well, even on tiny properties. Um, this, is, this is Pam Carlson's property in, in Chicago. It's one-tenth of an acre. It's a beautiful one-tenth, but it is in the middle of Chicago, and it is totally isolated. Um, from any, any natural areas, but she's recorded 124 species of birds that have used her, her property. So no property is too small, and that includes a flower pot. Most of all, ecological landscapers are going to know that conservation works. 
So here are just a few examples. We talked about the fact that we've, we've lost 3 billion breeding birds in North America in the last 50 years, but not waterfowl. Waterfowl, our ducks, our geese, have increased 54%, increased 54% in that same time period. Why? Because we, we worked at concert conserving them. We conserved uh, the wetlands that they need. We rebuilt them. Ducks Unlimited put a lot of money into waterfowl conservation, and it worked. It worked. <clears throat> so we can do that in other places as well. The Natchusa grasslands in Illinois, it's 3,800 acres. Got more than 730 native plant species and 180 species of birds have been recorded here. It used to be a cornfield. So we can turn it around. We really can. And now I'm just giving you a few examples. There's a lot of examples out there. There is some good news out there. And here's more good news. This is where I live. This is what uh, our property looked like when, when Cindy and I moved in in the year 2000. It had been mowed for hay. It was part of a farm mowed for hay. Just about nothing there. That's what was there, invasive species. We had Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle. It was, you couldn't walk anywhere. Uh, and there's Cindy getting rid of all of it. You can control your invasives. Yes, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. And now uh, I've been taking pictures of the moths that, that are now making a living on our property. If we got rid of those invasive plants and put in the, the natives, I'm up to 1,140 species of moths so far. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. This is a complex, uh, very stable food web that is supporting um, lots of birds too. Beautiful things like, like uh, the chinkapin leaf miner or the skullcap skeletonizer. Some of them have crazy names like the neighbor, the little devil, the horrid zaley, the obtuse yellow, the explicit arches, the grateful midget, the pink shaded fern moth, the scribbler, the lemon plagodes, showy emerald, the green marvel, who wouldn't want the green marvel, or the tufted bird dropping moth, that's even better. Um, Harris's three spot, the bride, the eyed pectes, uh, and hundreds more species of, of crazy name moths at our house. And because we have all those, um, we've got the birds that eat those moths. People worry all these moths are gonna defoliate me, I'll have nothing but sticks. These guys are gonna make sure that doesn't happen. We've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our property um, because we've got the bird food. They're eating those, those uh, caterpillars before they can defoliate anything. And we have lots of invertebrate predators that are keeping them in check, like ambush bugs or assassin bugs or predatory stink bugs and many, many more. We've got lots of parasitoids, ichneumonid wasps. We've got predatory wasps. Uh, the, the real challenge is finding one of those caterpillars because so many other things are eating them and keeping them in check. And of course, we've got the mammals that depend on insects as well, like skunks, like possums, like raccoons, like our friendly fox here. This is a mother fox that bred in our front lawn last, last year. 25% of a fox's diet is, is uh, insects. And little guys we never see, a number of species of shrews are, are insect specialists as well. And of course, we've got the amphibians, the toads and the frogs and the four toad salamanders. Uh, and, oh, there we go again. We've got box turtles, we've got ring neck snakes. These guys are all insectivores and the cutest little gray tree frogs that you've ever seen. They're actually green when they're, when they're tiny. Um, but the question is, is sharing the lawn or reducing the lawn going to be enough? Well, this is where uh, the lawn is actually distributed in the US. There's certainly a lot more lawn in the East than there is uh, in, in the, the you know, drier areas of the West. Um, so it's not a good target all over the country. And I, did, I got out the calculator and, and did a few calculations the other day. We've got 1.9 billion acres in the lower 48 states. So big country, less than 12% of it, as we said, is where 228 million acres is protected. That leaves 1.6 billion acres that is unprotected. Now, if 78% of the US or 1.3 billion acres is privately owned and we restore 20 million acres of privately owned uh, property, that's only 1.53% of what needs to be restored. So reducing the lawn is a good step. It's a low hanging fruit, but it's not gonna be enough. Our goals uh, in Homegrown National Park have been too modest. We need to expand those goals, which means we have to move beyond shrinking the lawn. That's okay, there's plenty of ways to do that. Uh, most of our privately owned land is actually in small woodlots. 
it's in cropland or it's in rangeland. Those are those are private properties. So let's talk about each one of those. There's 406 million acres of woodlots managed by private citizens, not logging companies, private citizens, woodlots on, on private property in the US, 406 million acres. 738,000 private forest landowners in Pennsylvania alone owning beautiful places like this. And that's controlling 11.5 million acres of Pennsylvania, the private landowner. How those woods are managed as well as their invasive species load is gonna determine their biodiversity value. We can manage them in a way that it really increases biodiversity or not so much. Uh, and there's a number of organizations that are, are working very hard at sustainable forestry. This is one of them, Foundation for Sustainable Forests in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, and, and to boil it down very quickly, uh, instead of high grade harvesting, in other words, taking the very best trees and leaving the worst, um, they're pursuing worst first, forest management. So they're leaving the best trees and taking the, the not so good trees. High grade harvesting, uh, taking the best and leaving the rest provides a good harvest once, and then you're done. That's it. Worst first selection with smaller, more frequent harvest leads to higher yields over time indefinitely. That forest can be managed uh, indefinitely that way. So that's definitely the, the, the approach that we need to be taking. We also need to control the invasives that are throughout most of our, our private woodlots. This is what uh, one looks like near, near my house. And we need to manage the invasives at first by managing the deer that are creating these invasive problems. We have an overabundance of deer from coast to coast, from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific, uh, different species of deer, mostly whitetail, uh, that are eating the natives and leaving the non-natives. So they're pushing the competitive uh, advantage towards the non-natives. They won't touch the burning bush. They won't touch the, the autumn olive. They won't touch the, the uh, barbarian, all of those guys, but they'll eat the baby oak tree and everything else immediately. So of course we end up with, with uh, forests that are completely saturated with these invasive plants. Uh, and and um, over browsing is eliminating uh, recruitment in our forest so that uh, when these, these trees, so here's a deer exclosure, uh, keeping the deer out here. This is what an understory should looks like. This is what it looks like often with, with uh, too many deer or it's covered with invasives that they, they won't eat. So when these trees fall down for whatever reason, there's no baby trees to come up and replace them. Uh, it also encourages not just, you know, all kinds of invasive plants like Japanese stiltgrass, but also it's looking at like Asian jumping worm, which are a huge problem around the country. There's an association or lack of association. When you have too many deer, you've got a lot of Asian jumping worms. And when you take the deer away, the Asian jumping worms go away too. Why? Nobody knows. We don't have a clue. But uh, if that holds up, that's a good, it's our only weapon in controlling Asian jumping worms. All right, let's talk about cropland very quickly here. A uh, good part of the country is in cropland. As a matter of fact, all of the light green here is cropland. It's a fair chunk of, of the, the, uh, the country, 410 million acres. So we've got to grow our crops for sure, but there are ways we can, can increase biodiversity in cropland without impacting yield, uh, several ways. One would be managing roadsides. The new uh, uh, agricultural ethic is to get rid of all the quote weeds, that's the native plants that used to be there, uh, and replace it with lawn. So now we have an ecological deadscape uh, right next to the cropland. We've removed the hedgerows. Um, we, we've, uh, you know, prairie strips, those are the, the, the blooming plants that support our pollinators and the monarchs and everything else. Um, they can be replaced even right in the middle of our cropland. And we need to minimize our use of, of uh, pesticides, insecticides, particularly neonicotinoids. Let's talk briefly about each one of those. You know, we've, we've had disasters declines in, in monarch butterfly, primarily because of that conversion of Midwestern farmland roadsides that used to be covered with quote weeds. Um, they're now sprayed with Roundup and, and it's lawn. No increase in yield at all because these are Roundup ready corn and soybeans. You can spray them with Roundup. You get rid of all the weeds in the crop, but now we're getting rid of the weeds outside of the crop. Uh, and by weeds, I mean good native plants like asters and, and milkweeds. Disastrous for the, the monarch. But instead of this, we have the option of creating roadsides that look like this. And people are starting to do it. Um, all these areas should be part of Homegrown National Park. Uh, there's more than a thousand miles of roadways in Iowa that now are, are essentially little prairies. 
because of restoration like this. Prairie strips are, are uh, strips of native plants that can be added right in the middle of a crop land. These are, these are soybeans. Um, up to 10% of, of a farmer's yard or, or property can be in, in prairie strips and be really effective in uh, conservation. They support pollinators, of course, but they reduce topsoil loss by 95%. You put them perpendicular to the flow of water when it rains hard and it intercepts the topsoil. It also filters out the pollution. Uh, the extra nutrients that come off the, the cropland before it gets into the Mississippi River and creates a dead zone in the, in, the, uh, in the Gulf. And by the way, you've got the same problems with, with um, agricultural runoff in Florida for sure. Think of those red, red tides. Pollinator strips can help that. And it's, uh, it's supported by cost share programs from uh, CRP, USDA programs. So the farmer doesn't have to give up anything to do this. And returning the hedgerows that used to be there. I know we have giant farm equipment uh, and we've gotten rid of hedgerows for convenience, but there's many places they can come back. And I'm talking about multi-species hedgerow, hedgerows uh, that can support an awful lot of, of creatures. I'm gonna sh share one quick study with you that we did in hedgerows a few years ago. This is a hedgerow invaded with autumn olive and multiflora rose and lots of other things. We simply compared the uh, caterpillar communities in hedgerows that were invaded with the caterpillar communities in hedgerows that were not invaded with non-native plants. And when they were invaded, they had 68% fewer species of caterpillars. They had 91% fewer numbers of caterpillars and a 96% reduction in the biomass of caterpillars, of the weight of the caterpillars. In other words, the amount of bird food present reduced by 96% when you allow your, your hedgerows to become non-native. So we have to keep them native and we can increase an awful lot of biodiversity. And then finally, uh, we've got to avoid neonicotinoid seed, seed coatings. We this, I don't want to be nasty, but this has been a giant scam here. All of our, our uh, major crops, like, like corn and soybeans, they're, the seeds are pink. That's covered with neonicotinoids. Only 5% of the active ingredient on that seed is taken up by the plant. 95% washes off into the water table uh, or is blown away on the dust. It's 7,000 times more toxic to insects and birds than is DDT. Uh, so, and it's used preventively. It's, 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 uh, it's a prophylactic. It's on the seed in case you have an insect problem, not because you have an insect problem. And studies have shown that they do not increase yield at all. So we are poisoning the world, and I mean the world, although Europe has already banned them, um, just in case something happens. And the reason farmers do it is because it's, it's really cheap, but that's not a good enough reason. So we need to avoid that. Okay, finally, rangeland. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland uh, in this country. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. What can we do uh, to increase, and it's on private property, by the way, what can we do to increase the biodiversity on rangeland? There's two major things. Avoid overgrazing. This is a, a uh, experimental range in Nebraska that Cindy and I visited. Uh, those are cattle, they're not bison, uh, but these are all sunflowers. All of the, the prairie birds were there. It was a highly diverse place because there were not so many cattle there that they overgrazed it. So that alone is a, is a big plus. But we also have to keep those cattle out of riparian carters. Um, we have to restore those riparian carters by fencing the cattle out because what they do is they eat the stream side vegetation that manages those waterways. Uh, I'm talking about cottonwoods and willows for the most part. The cattle eat that. It doesn't take a lot of cattle to eat it and totally destroy that, that riparian um, system in a rangeland. And then everything that needs that water suffers because there's, there's less water, um, it's dirty, uh, all kinds of nasty things. So restoring our, our riparian carters in rangeland is another big uh, uh, way to increase biodiversity. Now there's something common to each one of these conservation approaches that I've just talked about it. And I realized what it was when I got a paper from a, a student in my class uh, last, last spring, Amanda Crandall is a grad student, uh, and she was writing about something, but she said, we claim to be managing species and habitats, but what we really are actually, what we're managing actually is people. Uh, and I realize she's exactly right. Uh, it's not that we don't know how to put these, these ecosystems back together again. We've got to manage people in a way that allows us to do that. That is the cultural challenge. 
So we're talking about changing our, our culture, changing it from what is now an adversarial relationship with nature to a collaborative one. Can we do this? Well, I think we can. It, it, you, know, it, you don't have to save biodiversity for a living to change the culture, but you can save it where you live. You can save it by joining Homegrown National Park and getting in to the conservation that that entails. And if we join Homegrown National Park, it empowers each one of us. Most people feel powerless today with the, the Earth's huge problems. And they, you know, it's so easy to think that one person cannot make a difference, but one person can. One person can shrink the lawn, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can turn out the lights, one person can make sure they don't use any nicotinoids, one person can fire Mosquito Joe, one person can, can use keystone plants. These are easy things to do for one person right where they live. Uh, and if you join Homegrown National Park, you can contribute to a national movement that is really going to make things better. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You'll get depressed if you do that. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can manage. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you focus. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Um, or vote. You know, changing the, the, the culture of this adversarial relationship with nature it can happen right at the top if we vote cleverly or donate to, to organizations that are trying to do that. Lots of things that everybody can do. Out of Leopold, you know, one of the, the major fathers of, of modern conservation, um, said a lot of very important things. But, but one thing that really resonated with me is he said, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. And I know he was talking about the emotional connection to nature, but I'm gonna argue that nobody can live long without wild things because it's the wild things that keep us alive. So just paraphrasing uh, what John F. Kennedy once said in his inauguration, ask not what nature can do for you, ask what you can do for nature.